Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. Jay Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, Jay Warner Wallace. Thanks for joining us at Cold Case Christianity. I am Jay Warner Wallace. Uh, I want to talk this week about a kind of a recurring theme in our show here, if you watch it very often, and that is about the um, crisis that faces us as a church, especially in Protestant churches, that uh, really concerns young people who are leaving the church in general, with the big C, uh, at a rate higher than any other group and at a rate higher than ever before in history. And so what we see is the kind of growing secularization of our country here in America involving uh, churches that are losing membership uh, really in that key block of like the millennials from, say, uh, 18 to 30. That is the block of people who are leaving in big numbers. Surveys re- expose this all the time. I'm not going to go through all those again, although I referred you to my uh, website. There is a single article there called, Are Young People Really Leaving uh, the Church? And you can look for it under just the keyword updated because it's the one article on my website that I continue to update with the latest information and the latest surveys. By the way, you can always download those as PDF files for your own uh, use. But when people ask me, um, what, what should we do about this? What, what can be done about this? What is the approach the church ought to take? I, I typically talk about the thing that's going to be the topic of this episode. And I tell people all the time, stop teaching young Christians. Stop teaching young Christians. And that is what I want to talk about on today's episode. Um, now, of course, I say it that way to kind of get everyone's attention, Right. But if you think about it, it makes sense. And and what I mean by that is that clearly, wherever church you might be in, uh, there are great teachers in the church. There are lots of people who are gifted, uh, called by God, have talents, can teach. And they've been teaching in the church for generations. They've had generation after generation of some of the best teachers in the the country happen to be teaching in church. And look, you know that there are great teachers out there. Um, For example, if you've ever listened to the podcast of William Lane Craig from his Defenders class, you know that there is not a finer um, set of lectures and talks available online as a podcast than William Lane Craig's Defenders class, which is just the Sunday school class that he teaches at his church. We've got great teachers teaching in Christendom, but when it comes to young people, in spite of the, all the uh, assets we have, apparently it's not really helping much because it's in that, uh, in that climate of good teaching in local churches that we still have this crisis developing. So apparently there's some kind of a disconnect between the teaching that's occurring in the local church and the attrition rate of young Christians, right? So I tell people all the time that there is a way to approach this, and I learned it as a youth pastor with my own group that I saw was experiencing the same attrition rate as every other youth group, and I wanted to stop it. And so I shifted my model, and I abandoned teaching. Instead, I learned how to employ a training model. So stop teaching. Start training. And you might think, well... Okay, it's just a semantic little pl- trick you're playing there. There's really no difference between teaching and training, but there actually is a huge difference between teaching and training. Look, I remember uh, um, working in law enforcement and being a part of a number of either uh, rapid response teams. I was on the SWAT team for three years. And I can remember that we would train intensively all the time on the SWAT team. And we would do it by role playing on using abandoned schools, abandoned apartment buildings. If if something went abandoned in our city, we would find out about it and we would then kind of use it to train. And so we would set up scenarios. What if you got a barricaded suspect on the second floor of an apartment building? How would you handle that? What if you got a barricaded suspect or you've got a robbery takeover or some? We create these scenarios and then we would role play. We'd put the bad guys would just be other SWAT members. And we would either use you know, paintball or something that would show our effectiveness. Now, it sounds like fun, right? And it is fun. But when you're the bad guy trying to hide or you're the good guy 
playing, you know, your role in the five man entry team and some SWAT tactical, by the way, the SWAT guys who are working as the bad guys in the role play, they are tactically sound, probably far more tactically sound than the real bad guy you're going to encounter in this scenario in real life. You know, they know where to hide, they know how to shoot, they know the angles to take. And so when you're coming in as part of that five man team, trying to find the bad guy who's role playing in this scenario, and, and then you get shot in the forehead with the paintball, it makes you realize that uh, this is really, uh, if in a real life situation, this is a life and death matter. We continually train as first responders. And if you think about it, we are training for events that we hope we will never have to encounter. And for many of us, uh, you may never encounter those. Well, you may never get called out to that kind of a scene. You hope you go your entire career without having to ever fire your gun. But you train as though it's going to happen tomorrow because that's what makes you uh, safe and equipped and prepared. So you find yourself training over and over and over and over again for scenarios you'll probably never encounter. That is the uh, one important aspect of training. And what makes this powerful is that you know tomorrow might be the day that you have to employ this. In fact, it's knowing that there's a real challenge right around the corner that shifts teaching into training. Remember, Boxers train. First responders train. Why do boxers train? Well, because they're going to fight in the ring. And they might get fat in between fights, but once they schedule that fight eight weeks out, they're going to spend the next eight weeks training vociferously because they're going to be in the best shape of their life on the eve of that fight because if they're not, they might get beat or even hurt in the ring. It turns out the calendared challenge, either it's a fight or whatever it is you're calendaring, and for us as first responders, it's knowing that we often will get involved in things and we're, you know, we need to train so we can be ready for those things. That is what turns teaching into training. Now, we're going to talk about this training model over several episodes of the Cold Case Show. But, but and again, if you think to yourself, well, look, I'm not interested in this personally because I don't have this issue. I don't have, I'm not leading young people. Maybe you say, I don't even have young people in my life. Well, we're in a culture right now where you'll see there's a rise right now of case-making resources for Christians. Uh, stations and networks like NRB TV are becoming more and more popular. Why? Because we know the culture is more and more resistant to the Christian worldview, and we have an opportunity now to make the case, to train, to be ready to make the case, because the next challenge we might be facing might be tomorrow in the workplace. It might be tomorrow in your family context. It might be tomorrow at the Supreme Court. It might be tomorrow in legislative uh, halls all across America. The tides are shifting. We need to be able to make the case at every level from people like you and me who have no voice in, in the government to people who do. Now is the time to know why Christianity is true and to be able to make the case for what we believe as Christians. We'll take a break. When we come back, I want to start to kind of show you a couple of good resources you can use that will help you to make the case and understand the culture. And then we want to talk more about what makes training so unique when compared to teaching. I can remember when my kids were young, uh, growing up, that we made choices as a family. My wife and I made choices that really were in the best interest of our kids. We were raising kids. Um, for example, if we wanted to go out to eat dinner, we would pick the spot that was really better for them than it was for us. If we didn't really want to eat there, but that's good for our kids, so we go there. What movie should we go out and see? Well, I didn't see the movies I wanted to see. I ended up seeing the movies my kids wanted to see. Uh, what kinds of vacations should we take? Well, we're going to take kid-friendly vacations, right? Because we're raising young people and we want to do what's in the best interest of young people. Well, we have a great opportunity as a church because it turns out as a church family, we are raising young people. They're around us all the time. And we have a choice. Do we want to have church be the way that's good for me at my age? Well, no, I'm raising kids in the church. I want to shape my faith in a way that blesses them, make decisions about vacations that bless them, make decisions about my music choice, how I study, all these things, I make decisions with my kids in mind. And now I'm making those decisions with the kids in my church in mind because I have an opportunity, an opportunity to give them something more than a blind faith, to give them something more than a faith that will crumble once it's questioned. 
I want to give them a skill set as detectives that they can then use to thrive, that I can use to thrive. You take great risk when you have great confidence. The less confidence you have, the less risk you're willing to take. We have an opportunity as a church family if we want to hold to a form of blind faith that always kind of wonders, or if we want to develop a forensic faith that's driven on a skill set that will make you certain and will help our kids meet the challenges of the next generation. This is about answering an opportunity to live differently, to not have a blind faith, but to have a forensic faith. Okay, I want to introduce you quickly as we're kind of talking about young people in specific to two resources I've been meaning to mention for several weeks and they are coming out uh, right about now. If you're, of course, if people watch this show, they podcast it, they watch it in archive, I get that. So you have to go back and take a look at finding these resources. The first is a book by John Stone Street and Brett Kunkel. Brett Kunkel has been serving an, as the student impact director at Stand to Reason, and uh, John Stone Street is, of course, at Colson Center, where I serve as a senior fellow. Now, I'm gonna tell you that this book um, is quite important book, and if you look at it, it's, it's meaty, right? It's not a small book, it's not a, one of those throwaways. This is a book that will help you understand the challenges. It's called A Practical Guide to Culture. Boy, if ever there was a time when you needed a practical guide to culture, isn't it now? And what's great about it is it's thorough, but it's winsome. It's a fast read. If you've ever had a book you thought was this thick and you thought, how could that be a fast read? This is because it talks about the very issues that you and I are most concerned about. Those issues that really impact us as Christians and how we can have our Christian worldview impact the way we assess cultural issues. I cannot recommend more highly this book. Uh, you need to get it if you want to understand what young people, but more importantly, what you are facing here in the church as part of the church as we're addressing issues of culture and how we see those things through the lens of our Christian worldview. Here's another book, which is very specific to young people. It's called Welcome to College. Now, this book is um, a, a, re, a second edition of a book that Jonathan Morrow wrote earlier. Now, John Stone Street, who also wrote the foreword for uh, of my book, Forensic Faith, uh, wrote the foreword uh, for this book, and he's the author of the other book. So this is, I guess, the John Stone Street show today. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this book is the go-to manual for everything that your students will face in college, your Christian students. If there's one book you get for that issue, and I think what happens here is that a lot of people wonder, how do I help my young people? And then we wait until they're a year into university and they're already experiencing the crisis and now we're wringing our hands and it's too late as a parent. That's why I think this book, Welcome to College, is the book that you ought to open first. And you'll see it's not just for you, it's also for your students. So those two books, um, Welcome to College and A Practical Guide to Culture, I think are two that I want to recommend to you and commend to you uh, to get started in thinking about this issue of how to prepare young people to address the culture and what they're going to face in college. Now, that being said, I just want to talk about why I think um, this is so important as we go forward. Training, I mean. Training. Look, um, we're going to find ourselves in positions where we feel, most of us feel this, this calling to evangelism, right? It's the Great Commission calling. And, and I see this, and it frustrates me a little bit, because I see that, that people want to act as Christians in the world. And they, they kind of get one half of the, of the calling and miss the other half. Here's what I mean. You know, on the sides of Los Angeles Police Department uh, cars, there is this expression to, to serve and protect or protect and serve. And protecting and serving are two aspects I think that are critically important for us to understand, because I think they reflect the nature of God. Now, I don't know that the person who designed that logo or that motto for the Los Angeles Police Department had any inclination that these were related to theological principles in the New Testament, but he catches it uh, even by accident. Maybe it's just because it's reflected in him as a created being in God's image. That God is the perfect balance between justice and mercy. This idea of justice, truth and, and grace, truth and mercy, justice and mercy. And you see that expressed in this idea of protecting and serving. Protecting is really that part that is grounded in truth. You, you, we want to protect our young people from bad ideas. 
that are out there in the culture. We want to protect them spiritually, protect them physically, protect them intellectually, protect them emotionally. Protections at many levels. And we find ourselves uh, wanting to share truth and wisdom with our young people and with the world around us in order to offer this side of God's nature, this protective truth side. Because there's justice cannot be executed. Justice cannot even be offered unless, of course, we are grounded in what's true. There's another side to us, which is really about serving. Serving those who are different than us, serving those who are in need. And you see this call for both in Scripture, that we are called to, to, to make disciples, which is going to involve both of these attributes of God, the protection side, the justice side, the truth side, and the service side, the mercy side. I've written about this in the book Forensic Faith. And so if you look at Forensic Faith, the book that I wrote this year, it does talk about this particular issue in this section on training. And I've used this illustration to help you kind of see a frustration that I sometimes feel. And you'll see it here uh, in this illustration from the book. where We talk about how it is that people um, serve, how people uh, express this... this um, this, this uh, double purpose we have of both providing truth, protection, and mercy. So we see here that we perform deeds of service. That's the service part. And we proclaim the gospel. But these aren't necessarily two different things, although we have a tendency in the church to separate the two. It turns out, as you see in this diagram, that every performance of a deed, every act of service is really another proclamation of the gospel if we connect the two and we are explicit about what is motivating us to do the deed of service. Now, I will be honest with you, there are times when I'm frustrated that people have a sense that we are called to just do the deed of service, just do the act of service. Don't even have to mention that you're a Christian or where it comes from. And I get that. But if we just meet people's needs, but never meet the most important need they have, which is to hear the truth of eternal life, you're talking about a right to life, right? That's one of the basic things. Well, if that's true, there is a right to eternal life, and that would be the greatest uh, um, right you would possess. So we have to take time to, to see that even our acts of service are an opportunity to share the gospel, and we need to get ready for those opportunities. And that's when I talk about this model we call training. Why would I even get involved in this shifting from teaching to training? Because I want us to be equipped to share the gospel. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk about then what it means to shift toward a training model. Welcome to the One Minute Apologist. One Minute Apologist. We interview the world's leading apologists to provide credible answers to curious questions. What makes the cumulative case for God so powerful? Well, let's say I was going to work you as a suspect in a case, and, and I had um, a witness who said, I saw Bobby there. Okay, great. That's one piece of evidence. Not bad. Of course, if I have more evidence, uh, that would be better. Two people said that. What if I had this? A couple of people will say they saw you there. Your fingerprints and DNA are there. You've made statements that implicate you before and after, and you have behaviors that people watch that seem to implicate your involvement. Well, now I have a lot more evidence, but interestingly, it's in four different categories. Some direct evidence, some forensic evidence, some physical evidence. These are the kinds of things that make a case powerful. Not just that we have lots of pieces pointing to the same uh, conclusion, but they're from, from, from such different, diverse forms, categories. Well, the case for, for, for God's existence is very similar. In the sense that we have eight pieces that I can identify in God's crime scene. You know, you have the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, two cosmological pieces. You have the uh, appearance of, of, of life in the universe and the appearance of uh, design in biology, two biological pieces of evidence. You have uh, consciousness and free age, oh, two mental pieces of, it, of, of evidence. And you also have objective moral uh, values and evil, two moral pieces of evidence. These are very different categories. You've got hard sciences, you've got philosophy. There's lots of things to think about here and all those different categories point to the same there's one common causal factor that could explain all eight pieces in four very different categories the same way you might have been the one common causal factor that would explain all the evidence well you're the most reasonable inference if God can explain all of these things by the way no one explanation for the beginning of the universe the the, the, the uh, let's say the multiverse generator or the the quantum vacuum that can't give you consciousness free agency moral values and evil the things that, that, that one common causal suspect could do all of it, though. 
And that is a divine intruder, a, a, a cosmic creator, an all-powerful, all-knowing God who's non-material, non-spatial, uh, non-temporal, that's creative, that is a source of information in the DNA, that is a conscious mind who chooses freely, that is the standard for moral good, is the standard for what we call evil. That kind of explanation could unify the entire evidence set. And that's what we see happening, and that's why God's existence is the most reasonable inference from the evidence. Okay, so think about this for a second. Imagine first responders of every stripe, you know, medical, fire, uh, law enforcement. What if all of these folks who work as first responders, and remember, first responders have the unique position of being in the world, but really not of the world. And here's what I mean by that. There is an apartness to first responders. Uh, we train in a way that's unique to each of us, to our disciplines. We, uh, we wear uniforms that separate and identify us in the culture, so we sit apart by way of our uniforms. Um, we kind of hang together in families, and we feel sometimes like if you don't do this kind of work, you don't really understand what we're experiencing. There is an apartness. There's a community, a family that we cling to. We train separately. We have a higher standard typically, which is why when you see a police officer do something he should not be doing, you are so... Uh, um, um, outraged. It's because you know that this, this person ought to be holding to the higher standard, not just the average standard. This is the person who enforces the laws. This is a guy who has to be beyond, or gal who has to be beyond reproach. So it makes you angry when you see someone break. Why? Because they're set apart in that way. So there's a set apartness of first responders, yet at the same time, they are asked to consistently engage culture. They're going to be called to do the rescue over and over and over again. So there's hardly a group I can think about that's not more engaged in the culture while simultaneously set apart from the culture. And what does that sound like to you? It really is what we are to be as Christians. So there are some things we can learn from first responders that I think would help us to do our job and to be more effective as Christians in culture. One of those things, I think, is to do with training. Look, uh, if you could somehow, if every first responder you knew could handle every call for service by simply getting on the phone and handling over the phone, you know, you, you call and, and basically we just tell you what to do over the phone. We never ever have to leave our stations, leave our departments, leave our buildings. If you could handle every call for service without ever having to leave the building, do you think you'd ever train, say physically or tactically, or, or would you ever train in anything other than answering the phone? Of course you wouldn't. There's no point in training if you've got no intent on deploying. It's the fact that you know you have to deploy regularly that causes the need to take training seriously. Now, of course, I think you know where I'm headed with this. If we in the church think that we can just stay in the church and whatever we experience as Christians is what happens on Sundays in that building or Wednesday nights or whenever it is you enter that building, if that's what this is, kind of a Christian club we come to and we engage each other in that Christian club, if we don't ever have an intention to deploy, to take the message to the streets, to be involved in rescue, well, then there's no point in training. And if I'm honest with you, that's my concern. My concern is that really we don't train. We don't set because we have, we're not going to set a calendar date. Remember I told you that setting the calendar date is what turns training into teaching. It is the key thing. We're going to talk about it in an upcoming episode. But it is the key thing that turns the corner. Once you know the battle has been set, you've got to go out on that day to do this thing. You know you've got to be ready before you get to that day. So now whatever it is you've been talking about becomes training because you are getting ready for the calendared event. Now, if you never calendar an event, then there's no reason to train. You're just going to teach. Blah, 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 blah. It may help you feel good that day, but you're not getting ready to do anything. When we talk about equipping the saints, what are we equipping them for? So if you look at the life of a church, and I often get asked to speak at churches, and one of the things I'll typically do before I go is I'll go to the website of that church, and I'll pull it up, and I want to see their calendar. I want to see, is the life of this church simply the meeting? Or is this a church that's engaged in culture? Because if it's engaged in culture, it's far more likely to be a church that trains rather than a church that, a church that teaches. Does that make sense? It turns out it's that 
everyday practical deployment that gives you the need for training and you're far more likely to be engaged in training because what's the alternative? Got to do it. If I don't do it, I'm going to be in trouble. So uh, like all of us, forget about your church life for a second, your Christian life. If you're wondering if you're training, if you're wondering if you're even interested in training, if you're wondering if you're the kind of, of uh, Christian believer who is really doing something other than just attending church, well, simply look at your calendar. Look at your pocketbook. Tell me where you're spending your time, where you're spending your money, and I'll tell you what you love. So it's about us making a decision as individuals to energize our churches. And by the way, I do think sometimes think that as leaders, and I've been this kind of a church leader, that we have a tendency just to meet the expectations and requests and needs of our people. We don't lead them someplace new. We simply respond to what they want. So it turns out if that's the case, we could actually change church culture by changing what we as believers want. That would make a huge difference, wouldn't it? Now, before I end this episode, I want to tell you why this became so important to me as a church leader. I was a youth pastor who was engaged in the arts. My background before I became a cold case detective and became an evidentialist was that I had a training uh, bachelor's degree in design, a master's degree in architecture. So I took the approach that everything on Sunday needed to be a beautiful visual and audio and emotional experience. I wanted you to experience God. His presence. I wanted you to experience. And there's ways in which you can kind of make that more possible, open that up, craft that kind of experience. And that was the context in which I lost an entire graduating class of seniors. And I knew that that experience was good, but it was so far to one edge that I didn't have any good reason for these folks to hold on to this as a truth claim. And once they found they were experiencing something else that felt even better in university, they shifted from one experience to another, and off they went. It's time for us to shift the way we think about our Christian faith from experience to evidence. From experience to evidence. hope that helps you think about why we would want to train rather than teach. Time to stop teaching young people. Stop teaching yourself. If you've been reading and preparing, what are you preparing for? Get on your calendar. We'll talk about this more in episodes to come. But shift your ideas from just uh, taking in information to preparing for something. And you'll start to rethink the way you've been learning. It'll be less teaching and more training. Hope that helps you as you think about your own walk. And I'll see you right back here next week at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels and the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. It's available wherever books are sold.